Welcome to the Dealmaker Diaries, where you hear directly from the dealmakers who you invest with. M&A, real estate syndication, and more. Strap in for unparalleled advice, wisdom, and insight from some of the world's best business minds with Don Thomas and G1C Group. Welcome everyone to another episode of Dealmaker Diaries. Today's guest is Travis Balcom, the founder of and CEO of Balcomy Capital. Balcomi Capital is a boutique firm for high net worth and high income individuals that specializes in seldomly invested but well-known property type that performs better than most others. Having started his journey in private markets back in 2012, Travis has successfully been involved with over 55 million through acquisition, development, repositioning, dispositioning, asset management, and strategic planning. So let's welcome Travis to the show and get started. Let's go. But well, Travis, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, why don't you give us a quick introduction uh, of a little bit about yourself and what, what you're working on? Yeah, yeah. My name is Travis Balcom. Uh, I, I'm president of a company called Balcomi Capital, and we specialize in uh, self storage syndications. Got a little bit of other uh, type of real estate investments in our portfolio, but 95% of it is uh, self storage. We typically want to buy, uh, you know, in the sunshine states and reposition them, and then you know sell them off within a three to five year or you know time span. Okay. And, and sunshine states for those who might not be familiar with that term what exactly is sunshine state yep uh, you know if you're a football fan i would say the uh sec territory so you know texas okay. all the way to florida we have a, a facility in oklahoma um uh, probably be open to buying some more in oklahoma maybe kansas missouri but generally speaking uh, we want to invest in the um, markets where people are moving to and people are going to stay typically that's business positive or pro-business states and uh you know places that are great for to raise a family that sort of thing okay and um how what how did you become attracted to self storage what what are what what characteristics about that asset attract you the most well yeah i was i was a really big uh, single family player we were buying anywhere from you know five to ten houses a month Wholesaling a few of those, fixing a few of those up, renting out a bunch of those out. Um, we did that for about seven years, and I, and and honestly, I, I I was super unhappy. I was I didn't have a lot of money. I was sometimes I wasn't even able to pay myself. I had like seven people working for me. I felt like I worked for them. They got their paychecks when they made mistakes. I made I had to pay for their mistakes. Um, I wasn't good at running. You know, like with single family homes, you have very small margins. And you had to yeah. do a ton of volume. And I've learned that I'm not good at the ton of volume type set thing. And so um, we had a cash crunch. Had a, a My operator was like, hey, we need 150 grand to make it another six weeks. I'm like, we have 56 houses in inventory. Why don't we just sell one of those? And none of them are ready to sell. And I was like, I hate this. I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> that I, I'm going to go have lunch. I'll be right back. I'll let you know if I find the 150. Like I had lunch and my buddy was like, Hey, how's your day going? I'm like, well, I'm firing everybody when I get back after this lunch. So, so I just closed it down one day. I, I took all my files and, uh, you know, all my, all the important confidential stuff that I needed back home, uh, terminated, ter terminated my lease and then started unwinding a very large, uh, single family home business. We had 72 rentals and 42 rehabs going like renovations going. And, uh, that took about 28 months. And I just, I remember talking to my wife at the time and saying like, I got to find something that's a lot more foolproof than what this was. I need to find something that's easy, that I can scale, that I can really grow. And so that's when, I, you know, I I had kind of looked at multifamily. I'd looked at a few other things. Multifamily is kind of the next step to really for the single family investor. And I had, a, I had owned a 20 unit apartment complex and an 18 unit apartment complex the 20 unit apartment complex, I'm surprised I didn't die from. It was one of the worst experiences ever. Uh, lots of small businesses in each of those units. Uh, a lot of drug activity, a lot of prostitution. I was on a first name basis with the cops. 
awful. And then uh, and then the other apartment complex was fine and it was a very safe and enjoyable asset to own. But like I was only making like fifteen hundred dollars a month on it. And I was like, this this isn't going to work. So I didn't really like the multifamily space because the maintenance was too expensive. Uh, like a uh, two variable, like you know, one month nothing is wrong. The next month, someone has a a, a kitchen fire that costs you seventy five hundred bucks. The next month, the ACs get ripped out for the copper on the in, uh, vacant units. You know, stuff like that. Really, really disastrous experiences I've had with those uh, with that asset class. So I was looking for something that had really low maintenance, a lot of tenants. Uh, you know, I really like the subscription model from gyms, but I'm not a gym guy. So I'm like, I'm not mm-hmm. going to do that. But I felt like storage is kind of like my skill set and like the gym subscription model kind of combined with a very low rate of failure. So um, I had the real estate skill. I uh, The gym model would be like people are paying less than $100 a month and there's you have 300 tenants, 400 tenants, et cetera. And then uh, the low probability of failure was was the uh, you know the 28 year default rate for self storage collectively over those 28 years is less than one percent. I think it's 96 basis points. So mm-hmm. most of the storage facilities out there, and most of the ones that are levered, meaning the, most of the ones that have loans on it, uh, do not fail. And I was like, this, I think I can get here. I think I can grow here. So it took a while to really learn the business, but that's essentially why I chose storage. And it's worked out really well. Uh, you can grow value. You can add value quite a bit, which means you add add, add uh, equity to your investors and give higher returns to your investors a lot easier in storage than any other asset class I've been a part of. And so that's that's why we're going deep with storage. Okay, so you you identified as storage as the asset you wanted to invest in. So how did how did you go about educating yourself? Well, um, to go back to the single family space, I read 53 books to learn how to do it, how to flip a house, how to rent a house out, how, all that sort of thing. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm just going to do the same thing. So I got on Amazon and there was three books, <laughs> only three books on self-storage. And so I bought those three books, read those books, and then uh, got on YouTube to see if there's anything there. There, there was a couple of people, but most of the views were like less than 2,000. And that kind of got me excited because I felt like there's very few people in this asset class. I could probably do a really, if I'm as aggressive as I was in the house business, I'm a, I I can probably do really well here. And so, yeah, I, I read, read the three books and then I got on YouTube and watched a few videos. And there was one podcast back then um, that I uh, I think it was called Cast. It wasn't it wasn't even a self storage podcast, but it was a guy who owned self storage. And, um, and, you know, I watched, I, wa- I read, I listened to all of his, most of his, uh, podcasts to learn. Okay. And so once you actually started getting into it, how was your learning curve? Cause we all know you can read, but then once you jump into it and start taking action, yeah. that's where the real, real education comes into play. So how was, how was, yeah, your- I got real lucky. I got real lucky in my first, we bought five storage, facilities. we bought a portfolio of five that this, uh, sweet lady who still works for me, uh, n- knew it knew better than her backhand or back of her hand. Like she, uh, she's great. She can work for me as long as she wants to. Um, But she knew all the, she knew, she's like, she knew all the tenants when they would pay, why they are late, um, you know, how they pay, how long they've been there. They knew, she knew all this stuff. And so I was just able to go in there and take, um, take this facility that was being ran on green sheets. I don't know if you know what those are, but basically like, Spread, spreadsheets that are on paper. I had never seen them. My generation's never used anything like that. I'd, I've always had, you know, Excel. And so we, uh, she was using those and I was like, all right, we're going to move to this like storage software. And then, um, and, this, and, and then once we got the storage software up, everything was pretty automated, automated. So I, I would go, like, I went like the first three days I, I drove and came back to my, from my house. It was about a two hour drive. Then I would go once a week. Then I'll go once a month. And then I just stopped going and and I'm letting her run it. We have a 10 minute call every week and that's about it. And so, um, you know, sometimes we'll do some mailing campaigns to get the occupancy up a little higher if we're kind of low. But generally speaking, it's pretty pretty low maintenance, pretty low catastrophe, pretty low chaos. No one, the primary reason that there's not a lot of those three things, catastrophe, catastrophe, chaos, or maintenance is because people don't actually live there. People are, people are what cause all the maintenance. Like uh, in my apartment complex, I mentioned the, the, the fire, the, um, the kitchen fire, a guy was, he worked nights, he came home, uh, threw some wings and some hot, uh, oil, forgot about it because he was tired or maybe he was 
on something and uh and then and then he uh, the the uh, the wings caught on fire he threw a dry towel that caught on fire that ca- caught the cabinets on fire Le- you know seventy five hundred dollars later i'm stuck but like a ho- you know there's no one in these facilities it's really boring actually you show up no one's there maybe one person's getting their stuff out that sort of thing generally speaking it's just real real basic real boring and i i like that uh, i like the fact that i can be pretty aggressive on a pretty boring asset and and uh you know and make a make a pretty good return on it yeah absolutely all right so let's talk about um how self-storage is probably one of the most least risk averse and recession proof i don't have to i don't want to say it's totally risk averse but how is it you know pretty one of the least most least reverse and yeah, recession proof assets out there yeah, it's, you know, in a recession, there's a lot of things that go on in a recession. But before we talk about that, generally speaking, my tenants pay less than $150 a month. If I raise rents, they'll get frustrated, they'll gripe and complain, but they're not going to go rent a U-Haul, fill up their junk and move it to another storage facility that's $20 cheaper. It's not worth their Saturday or Sunday time. Right. Uh, and they're not going to take a day off to do that either. And so... A lot, of, a lot of people, it's like the low hassle. Like, you know, it's like all their stuff's there, um, $150 or less. They're going to forget about it. We we require people to get ACH or credit card. They have to pay. They either have to pay through auto draft on their ACH or auto draft on the credit card or debit card. Um, so that's one of the ways. So we're going to, by, you know, the fifth of the month, we have 98% of our, our, uh, our, rev- or our income for the month. Um, another reason is um, Americans just don't like to throw things away. You know, during the pandemic, people had to move, you know, their storage room, one of the rooms out, you know, clean that out and make it their office. And so they had to put their stuff into a storage storage unit. That's kind of it, it, you know. So in a recession, people are making less money typically. So they're going to need a smaller. They have to move out of their $2,800 rental and move into their $2,100 rental or $1,900 rental. Well, they don't want to throw that stuff away that they've already paid. So they'll store it. Uh, because Americans don't, if they pay for something, they're not going to throw it away. They're just, you know, this they're going to garage right. sell it or they're going to try to make some money on it. But generally speaking, I think it's because you have a very low operating cost. You have a low price tag per tenant. You have 300 <clears throat> to 400 tenants per facility. Like, um, my, my, so we have a, that portfolio is 396 units. And then, then our facility in Oklahoma is 277 units. Just a lot of people like comparing that to like a really big multifamily project. Or, or apartment, you know, a big multifamily is like 100 to 150. You know, those 200 units are like, you know, big leagues up there. And so, um, so that, so you have like the, the, the economies of scale, you have 400 tenants or so, and then you have very low, uh, you can run everything remotely through security cameras. You can have one person working, running all seven of my facilities. One person can do that um, with the, with the virtual assistant call center we have. Um a lot of things like that and then you know typically let's say you buy a facility for like a six cap right and you know the market market is 150 dollars for a 10 by 10 and that guy's getting 100 well what are you gonna do you're gonna raise it like the first couple months you're gonna raise it to 130 well that extra 30 bucks times 300 is nine thousand dollars a month that that doesn't come along with it operating expenses that's just bottom line dollar that goes straight to the new income and so because of that like you can really add a lot of value and so your 75 percent loan to loan to value purchase loan is now somewhere around 48 because you rose raised raised uh, revenue so you raised revenue so fast and so quickly and so it, it kind of pads the uh pads the risk there and so you know the debt service coverage ratio and something like that would be well into the 1.6 1.7 range absolutely okay and talk about the the benefits of investing locally and privately with uh, an investment outfit such as yourself. Like as far as passively, or yes, passively. okay, yeah, well, both pa- passively and, and actively, both. Sure. Well, um, you know, let's just start with passively. Passively, you're going to get uh, you're going to get a proportion a proportionate share of a very large in, uh, institutional grade asset class. So something that you wouldn't be able to buy, you get to take a, you you get to participate in that. Um, furthermore, you got a great operating team. So like you're going to get distributions, you're going to get cash flow, and then finally you're going to get tax savings. So 
Um, if, let's say we give you a nineteen thousand dollar distribution that year, um, you know, and, and there's a cost segregation component, so we can cost segregate the assets. Uh, we can depreciate the assets, so that will actually go against your your gain or or, or reduce your gain, and so. It, you know, you, you have a lot higher of a return because of the taxable or because of the tax depreciation than you would if you were just invest in a stock market REIT or something like that. That's also investing in institutional REITs. As far as active investors go, um, you know, like I, I, I guess you're referring to like a, like a co-sponsor. We typically can bring on a co-sponsor, which is someone that can raise capital that can possibly sign on debt. Uh, those those returns are multiple X's. So if you even bring money to the to the you're bringing so much other value by raising capital and raising and, and signing on the debt that you typically don't have to bring any uh, cash to the deal. Got it. Got it. All right. And, and talk about your team's and in investment philosophy. What are you guys? What What is your philosophy? And what what are the what are the boxes you tick when you're looking at an asset and thinking about purchasing or building from the ground up? Yeah, I, I would say that our philosophy is to 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 lead with integrity to make sure that no matter what we're doing, it, it's an investment that we would um, we would we would do outside of the fees, outside of the um, you know benefits to us as a general partner. Um, generally speaking, we get a seventy-five to eighty percent loan uh, loan to cost on these, and so we're we're bringing quite a bit of risk ourselves or we're taking on quite a bit of risk ourselves. So we're not going to do some, some weak asset just to get some fees to, to make it in towards the end of the month. Cause we're going to have to eat that when, when we're not performing and we can't pay the mortgage. That's going to be on us. Um, in addition to that, as far as like what we look for in storage uh, uh, in a storage market is we want the population to be growing we want the occupancy uh, within a five mile radius of that location to be uh, the occupancy of competitors within a five mile radius of that uh, location to be at uh, at max capacity. So full or above 90 percent um, like we have one in Georgetown right now that we're about to build that is the 12 competitors around it are ninety nine point four nine percent full. So there's very little units within a five mile radius for anyone in that that town to store their stuff at they they need there's a lot of more storage demand needed or storage uh units needed in that space um but we want to look at so pop increased population at uh competitors are at, at or max capacity uh, if it's an existing facility we want it to be pretty full because we're going to raise rates and we're going to lose 20 percent of our tenants uh, by raising rates um we want to make sure the household income is above sixty five thousand um yearly uh Income, we want that uh, the uh, average home sell to be, uh, home price to be above two fifty, and uh, let's see that that's that's that that'll get us looking at the deal. If if those things check, if we check the box on that, we're going to be looking at the deal a lot harder. Okay, and um, of course, um, in the past couple of years, interest rates have been going up, and the market has changed dramatically. So, how how has that affected your investment thesis and how you approach? financing and leveraging investments and raising capital yeah that's that's been uh it's been a challenging one so as as it has been for any commercial real estate investor um Absolutely. we are uh you know we think the rates are probably going to go a little bit higher even though that sounds completely illogical and ignorant and stupid uh we think it's probably we're probably going to see a little bit higher just because of where inflation is how hot the market still is uh, yeah, I could talk to him blue in the face on this one, but, um, duly speaking, when we're looking at new a acquisitions, we're wanting to buy something that, um, if, if it's not positively cash flowing from day one, we can raise rates, cut expenses pretty easily. Like these are expenses like yellow pages or like monitor security. We want to cut those uh, out. And, and if by doing that, raising rates were positive cash flowing within the first six months, that's the goal. Um, on a deal like that, we would raise the 25% down payment, we would raise our fees, and then we would raise a, a, a hefty reserve, probably 12 to 18 months of mortgage payment reserves. And the whole reason is is because we want to, we're buying something that's losing money. We want to make sure that within six months, it's not losing money. If we whiffed on it and it starts losing money after we raise rates, we get lose too many people or whatever, then we want to make sure we have that big padding. Um, so we're, so I guess to answer that question, we would, we're, we're, raising more money per deal. 
And then we're communicating to our investors that um, our goal is they get it to a 10 and a half cap or performing as a 10 and a half cap. And when we get to that performance, uh, we can refinance it to an eight uh, with an 8% interest rate and still maintain a 1.25 debt service to coverage ratio. And so um, what the hard part is, is when you're entitling a facility, starting a, from scratch, you have a piece of grass and you're trying to get a, a city who, that doesn't want storage to give you a storage permit so you can build a facility. Um, you know, that's a two-year process. We started the one in Georgetown in 2021. It was in a crush because we could get a 4% interest rate. And now we're looking at getting an 8% interest rate. Um, and, you know, that that means we're going to have to raise more money for the interest only reserves. That means we're going to have to, we're going to pay a lot, you know, a lot more uh, in interest until we get that thing fully stabilized. It's probably uh, with the interest payment or with the interest that, that high, we're not going to cash flow like we want to cash flow, but a facility like that, the people that buy it don't buy it on debt. They just pay cash. And typically that's an extra space or a public uh, public storage or a life storage or a U-Haul, something like that. We'll come in and buy it. Cube Smart will also buy it. Um, those are pr public REITs that borrow money or that issue bonds, borrow money from SOFR or uh, SOFR plus 50 basis points and then um, you know can buy you out. So they're still buying at five and a half cap. So if we're, Georgetown, we're mm -hmm. building for nine and a half cap. Hoping, hoping that for a solid nine and a half cap, so or five and a half cap, so we'll make a four hundred basis point spread on that. That'll be great. Um, and then, yeah, and real know, quick, the, real quick to, sure. to interrupt for a second. So we're talking about Georgetown. So we're talking about Georgetown, Texas. So, so for the listeners yes. who don't know, it's not Georgetown in DC. So, folks, so you talked about um, convincing the city to let you build self storage when they maybe don't want it. What what, what does that process look like? Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. I'll, I'll tell you that. And it's uh, um, so you know, there's that specific city. Well, a lot of most of the cities in North Austin. So Georgetown, Texas, in North Austin, uh, most mm -hmm. of the cities in North Austin will not allow you to build a storage facility uh, by right. So the zoning will not allow you, meaning, meaning they've eliminated the zoning or are in the process of eliminating the ability to build a storage facility either at all or by right. And so, and why is why is that? Doesn't uh, it, it, there's a negative connotation with storage facilities. Historically, they're ugly. Uh, two, they don't provide jobs. They also don't provide sales mm -hmm. tax. They'd much rather have a restaurant in there that provides jobs, sales tax, property tax, and is really pretty to look at and gets people to come to your city. That's why they don't want to do that. Um, yeah. I know. Yeah, and so Cedar Park, Leander, Jonestown, they've all those are all subdivisions or suburbs of Austin. They're <clears throat> Good luck building in there. So with Georgetown, there's still a very small, there's one zoning, I think it's C1, that you can do it with a special use permit, meaning you have to spend, a. I think we were about $212,000 deep before we got that permit. Uh, and all that permit is allowing you to do is saying you can build a storage facility, but now you have to go to the site development plan permit process, which took another year. So it took a year to get them to say, yeah, you can build a storage facility here. If it looks like this, and it, honestly, ours is going to look closer to a hotel than it does a storage facility. It's so nice, and we had to make it that way because that's how they—that's the only reason they're going to let us do it. And then, um, and then, you know, the next twelve months after getting that um, is is about getting—you know—they they have to approve like all the normal stuff you would approve for a permit. So, um, well, two hundred thousand dollars, and you still might not be able to get it done. Yeah, two, so we were two hundred twelve thousand dollars deep. And we could have been told no, and we would have just been stuck. We would have had to because we 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 had to land in the contract at that point. We didn't own it, um, and so yeah, we could have burned. We could have just written that off. That would have been painful. We're now about half a million dollars deep on that, and we're uh, we're you know we're, we'll probably break ground in May, late May or June. And um, but yeah, it's it, it the great the silver lining on something like that is there's very few people who are going to go through that process. So therefore my com competition is going to be limited and um, it's going to take them a long time to get it done. So I'll be able to see, I'll have a, like a two year window before they actually be able to build be, before they're able to actually build. So I'll have two years to, to, to fill mine up, that sort of thing and maybe dispose of it or sell it if I need to. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I don't know if we're going to do that again, but we, we yeah. did it on this one. 
it was yeah there's a lot of uh, it it facilities you can buy and make money on yeah i mean you think it'd be an easier process especially if you can demonstrate that there's a need for it like yeah i mean you're looking at the sure the demand and the, and the what's available you think right can look at that like hey you have this amount of people in there you have this amount of storage facilities currently hey you, you guys need this here for your for your demographic so yeah yeah that's, def- that's definitely a process and not for the faint of heart for sure yeah a lot of so talk about so talk about unlocking access to off-market investment opportunities with with your processes sure. and systems that you guys use yeah um our our process is it, it's amazing these you know you let's say you're driving and you see a facility it looks like it old or needs to be bought improved typically the number on the side of the of the facility is the owner it's a cell phone um Mm. and uh you you know it's you're gonna and that's that's a that's a long nurture right they're answering their phone they're probably not wanting to sell so you gotta call them you gotta call them again you gotta text them you know we've had people cuss us out and we've had people say sure but then it was like impossible to try to figure out what they wanted. They didn't, you know, they're like, they weren't going to send us like a P and L like, well, we got to buy it on income approach here, man. Like we just can't like, you want me to measure it? And then like assume (laughs) there's a lot of, a lot of silly stuff there, but that's, that's really it. Um, It's really hard to send direct mail to uh, storage facilities because most of them don't have a PO. I mean, they don't have a postal box because they're just buildings. Um, you know, the tax bill gets sent somewhere else in order to find the tax bill. Sometimes it's really hard because like, you know, you might see one facility when you're visually looking at it. It's like, let's say it's three buildings, but one's on one parcel. Another one's on another parcel. Well, like you got to find those postal numbers first, and then you got to send it to the tax code. And so um, there's not really a really good way to send direct mail like you can with multifamily or, or houses. It's just, you're, you're at the mercy of, a fabricated way of building building that's 50 years old right so it's typically Mm -hmm. like oh i got some land i'm gonna put some metal buildings on and rent it out that's historic like 25 years ago that's what storage was now it's like a a, you know an institutional like high quality a lot of a lot of people a lot of players a lot of money getting thrown out of it because of stuff like recession resistance um you know institutional money's heading there because they know they can make a safe return um it's there's data showing it made that storage had the highest return out of all uh, asset classes uh over the last 28 years and so yeah it's 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 changed quite a bit but yeah that's how we that's honestly we found one of our facilities off market because i was headed to a mountain bike park and i called the number it it uh it was disconnected the number on the sign of the facility was disconnected i'm like this is a good thing (laughs) So then I did some research and I'm like, all right, I think this is the owner. And I sent him an email. He sent me an email back. Say, Hey, we're about to list it. And so, um, they wanted, they wanted a lot of money for it. I passed on it there. They had two buyers back out. They called me back and we bought it. So. All right. Very cool. All right. So yeah, before we hop off, why don't I put you through our lightning round and see what's behind the curtains here. Okay. So a softball and what, what book or books have, greatly influenced your life uh yeah man that's uh <clears throat> i read a lot so or listen to books I, i'll i'll mention three uh the first one is um the obstacle is the way by ryan holiday yeah uh, I, well. I, I started reading that book when the pandemic hit and i ended up just continuing to read it and rereading it and rereading it i think i read i've read it 37 times i feel like it's like a operating system for life um, second one is a, a rare book uh, called Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman. It's out of print. Um, the only way you can get it is Google it and hope that you can find like a digital copy somewhere. Um, it's a book about investment analysis from a like a, a stock market uh, level, but it specifically talks about how every investor gets really excited about making money on one thing. But what they don't think mm-hmm. about is what is the downside? Like what could go wrong here? And that's why most people lose money. If you just made sure, if you just invested based on protecting your downside, um, you would, you as long as you don't lose your principal, you continue to grow it. So to give an example would be like you invest in two things. One loses 15%, the other one makes 15%. Well, you're at zero. Yeah. If you'd have just done some more research, you would have realized this one was going to go to 15% and this one was going to go to negative 
those things existed already or in the, the those things were going to happen regardless if you invested or not one was going to go 15 percent, the other was going to lose 15 percent. but if you would have just done your research and realized that this one had a little bit more risk risk uh, the one that lost 15 percent has a little bit more risk to it then you could have stayed away from that and, and you would have made 15 percent. so it's just about the, it's a way to think about investing and the reason i i discovered it because a family office shut me down when I was pitching them long, like eight years ago. And, uh, and they're like, you should read this book. <laughs> so, so I read that book. And then finally, um, uh, man, I just went blank. It's a book uh, on quantum physics. The, um, let's, yeah, let's just, let's just leave it at those two. So, okay. All right. Awesome. So next one, if you could have a billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say? <clears throat> So key follow phrase, your dreams, or... follow your dreams and don't quit. Okay, very good. Yeah, definitely don't quit. All right, then um what have you become better at saying no to? Uh I would say the uh, the people that reach out to me, like, hey, you got a minute? The got a minute meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. can we just get together to talk about this i used to do yeah. that and then i realized that like no like no one was taking the advice i was giving them even though they like called me and wanted my advice and then the other guy was just like he just wanted to talk about ideas and i'm like I'm, i don't have time for ideas i only have time for execution yeah the, the pick your brain people yeah yeah all right so how is a failure or perceived failure actually allows you a greater success later yeah. So going back to when my house flipping business fell apart, uh, you know, I thought I was done. I, I remember thinking like, well, I'm going to work really hard and hopefully they don't, hopefully they don't come after me. <laughs> you know, like we had lawsuits, we had bank, uh, we had banks that were not happy. We had uh, hard money lenders that weren't happy. Um, all those guys got taken care of, um, not the people in the lawsuits, but um, the banks and the hard money lenders and the investors, all those guys got taken care of. They were made whole, plus they had got their investment. Um, and I, I would say that was probably the defining point in my life, uh, which really wasn't a point. It was a season of 28 months of unwinding mm -hmm. of you know a business that got way too big, way too fast, ran by a guy who um, was really good at running hard and at a brick wall. And so mm -hmm. I learned, I learned that I'm like, I, if I get out of this, this is how I want to structure it that I'm going to structure the next business this way. And I would say that's what we're doing right now with Balcomi is we're structuring it the correct way. We're moving a lot slower, being a lot more methodical, making sure everything we do makes money. And then and that'll, uh, and that'll get us to our goal, even if it takes a little bit longer than I want it to. All right. Good stuff. So, Travis, if anybody wanted to, um, before we hop off, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, reach out, learn more about um, some of the facilities that you're getting up and off the ground, what's the best way for them to contact you or get in touch? Yeah, you can reach me out on uh, Instagram at Travis underscore Bacom, B-A-U-C-O-M. And then mm -hmm. our website, if you want to get on the list to get uh, our next round of deals, is invest in storage deals.com okay all right awesome so yeah we'll run those across the bottom of the screen all right travis so yeah thanks so much for joining us today this has been a real pleasure listening to you and your thesis and your philosophy so thanks so much for joining us yeah thanks for having me donald all right likewise all right take care buddy i'll talk to you soon all right you too there you have it guys another episode of dealmaker diaries in the books if you enjoy and or find value in what we're doing, please do leave us a nice review. It goes a long way in keeping the show moving in the right direction. For you investors, if you're looking for places to put your hard-earned capital to work, head on over to our website, g1cgrp.com, and sign up for our investor list to be informed of the different projects we're raising capital for that will provide you with the cash flow your investments so much deserves.